All right, so let's get started. Um, how did you guys feel about um, week two? Do you feel like we should go over some function stuff and while loops, or should we just dive into this week stuff? This is kind of like an extra session where we can kind of focus on the things that you would like to see. All right. I'm just going to go over everything my way. Um, and then we'll probably, after that, maybe go over some assignments or something. So let's start out with functions. Um, let me make this big enough so you guys can see it. Why do we use functions? Um, so basically, um, the theory behind functions is, as programmers, we like to type as little as possible and repeat ourselves as little as possible and have room for errors as few as possible. Um, functions are good because basically we can write one block of code that can be reused over and over again. And so as long as we get that code right the first time, we can use it a lot. It's great. It's fantastic. So to make a function, we do def, and then we give it a function name. Um, let's just do say hi. I think we've done this one for, and then you give it parentheses. Um, this is where you can put, it's true, you can't. <laughs> uh, and you can put arguments here. So we can do that. We can say times. I think this is the example we had before. And then inside of our function, we could have the code. Remember everything that the function, just like an if statement or a for loop or while loop, everything inside here is going to be indented. So I can print hello and uh, I can print hi. And I don't want this, uh, whatever. I'll just leave that there. Um, so right now, if I press play, Nothing's going to happen because I didn't call it. Uh, you have to do a function call after that. So I'm just going to do say hello. And now it will be called and I ruined everything because I didn't use this thing. Um, so, oh, it's because I didn't put it here. Um, anyways, this is one way to do it. You have the function definition and the function call. This just tells Python to go up, find the matching function definition, and run all the lines of code here that are indented and inside of it. Now, Santa's going to tell you, and he's already told you, don't print things inside your functions. Um, generally, we only want to print when we're debugging and trying to make sure our code works right. So normally, we're going to actually use return. Um, so now I'm going to say return hello in this case. Um, notably, and this will send a string kind of like as an output, okay? And the difference here now, if I leave this code exactly the same, um, this is still going to do the function call and run this, but right now I'm not doing anything with this and I'm not printing it. So if you do it with a return statement, you have to actually print it out. Um, just a little thing. Everybody on board with that? I'm going to try and think of a better example. Um, I'm going to do sum. And we're going to get two numbers. And we're just going to return num1 plus num2. I'm just going to put a random print statement in here. Just say, I'm inside the function. And then I'm going to let me just change the name because sum is a keyword. And three and four. Okay. So when we run this, we do the function call and it sends positionally, it, it lines up the first parameter. This first argument here lines up with this thing. And then the second one lines up with the second one. So what this is doing with the parameters. So what, what about when you're adding arguments? 
I'm getting there, I think. I think we're on the same page. <laughs> Let me know if this doesn't answer your question, David. Um, and so basically, when you send arguments in your function call to be received and stored in, these, uh, in your uh, function definition, it's the same thing as saying num1 equals 3 and num2 equals 4. It's just matching these, and it's basically doing the, the, the equivalent of these two lines of code here. Um, you can give it any, you can have, like, so maybe I have um, a number, and let's just say that's three, and we have a number here. Remember, this is going to be the same because this just matches, it searches for... Um, a matching variable name, and then this three will be passed here, and then it'll still be stored in num1. So you could, you don't have to have like a matching variable name or anything. It just says whatever the literal value is, which is gonna be three in this case and four in this case, it's just gonna store them in this variable. Um, and we can use it. Everybody on board with how that works? It just creates these variables. So we don't actually have to do that. That's just kind of what's happening in the background. Okay. Um, had to throw my phone across the room. Um, all right. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Since we're already talking about functions, could you go over the append to list homework problem? I'm stuck on saying. Is uh, append to list in week two or three? I'll get to that when I get to week three, okay? Yeah, um, let me go over the uh, let me go over the functions real quick, and then I'm going to go over the week three concepts real quick, and then I will start diving into assignments. I think that's the plan. Okay, so everybody's on board with this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, okay, so that's functions. So the main reasons that we want to use functions again is reason, I'll just put them underneath here actually, is to avoid repetition. Um, it's also to, um, you know, make it so that less room for error because if you copy, paste code a lot, you could miss a detail if I could type um, and another important thing is yeah please post as a question David and I'll look into it um, and the last thing is like you can compartmentalize your code separate large chunks of code into smaller more readable and testable pieces of code. So those are the main reasons you're gonna use functions. Um, it's nice because once you've got a function set up, like if it was a math operation, all you have to do is send it to arguments or something or however many you want. And, <laughs> and um, basically you could just like, it's just like an input output thing. That's what I like to think of a function. If you've created your function well, You've got some information you send in, and assuming you have a return, you'll have some piece of information you expect to get out. Um, <laughs> testing is important, Sarah, <laughs> uh, for anything that's out in <laughs> Santa's having a heart attack. Uh, because anything that's like a real world um, code that you've you know, that's out in production that's being used by people, you have to make sure that works. And if you've got, if you notice on the learn website, for example, um, we've got these little test cases here. And so if we have several functions and several um, test cases associated with those functions um, and maybe a giant program that's thousands of lines long, you can make sure all the little individual parts that might have functions around them or something have the, the tests work for them so you don't have to like go through and have a bunch of print statements to make oh damn it 
I forgot there's a bunch of trolls out there. Uh, got them. Uh, but anyways, it's really helpful for testing if you have small little functions everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that you can really just test little tiny chunks of the code. And so if there is a bug, when you update one part of your code, it might break somewhere else. You can just test all your things real easily because, and, and know, pinpoint the problem very quickly if your functions are very small and easy to read. Everybody on board with that? Any other help people need with functions? <sighs> All right, cool. Then, yeah, I know. I'm going to do a pin to list after I get through this stuff. Um, all right. Unless you want me to do a pin to list now. Fine, I'll just do it now. I can find it. We're doing a pin to list. Here we go. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to drag this over to REPL. And I'm going to steal these test cases. I'm just going to I don't feel like using the platform. Uh, I didn't promise a dog. I'm not at that location today. There is no dog. The dog is a lie. All right. So the way this works is if we look at this, it says you're given a list and some data that you want to put on the list. Okay. Um, so let's do that. The dog ate the cake, yeah, pretty much. All right, so in this case, we have a list and we've got some piece of data. And so all we're gonna do is hungry list, that's our list here. You're, you're very special, David. Um, hungry list uh, dot append data. Um, I think that's all we need to do. Let me uh, insertion error, line four. Okay, I broke it. So we've got an empty list. What have I done? Oh, I'm just trying to do things in two lines at once. Boom. Okay, yeah, so you guys probably tried to do what I just did and tried to do it in one line. Well, you have to do the method um, separately on its own line before you get to the return statement. So this is our list name and we're just using the dot append method and the, the stuff in the parentheses there is gonna be the thing that you're gonna want to append to the end of your list. So in this case, it's a blank list. If you're ever having trouble with these, you can read the unit tests which are these guys down here, try and figure out what we expect to happen. So we expect that we're gonna call the function, we're gonna give it a blank list to start with, and then we're gonna give it list food, whatever that is. Um, and then we expect that after the function is run, we expect it to return a list that has that appended to it. Um, so the same thing here on the second line. Uh, we've got a list that's already got some stuff in it, and then we wanna add chips to it because obviously. And then after we do that, we just expect it to be appended. So I think what you guys might have had trouble with is doing this, trying to do this on one line when you need to do it on two. Does that answer your question? Because the return statement doesn't want you to do that. <laughs> um, these are like sometimes some methods well, it didn't work for me a second ago. Yeah. Yeah, you can't print it. And then, yeah, you just have to make sure you return the list.
take printout after? I'm not following you. Why does it need to be on two lines? Maybe I'm on, maybe it's a Python version thing. Let's see. I believe. All right, this should be Python too. Yeah, it's a Python version thing. Wait, no, that's, hold on, I didn't do it in one. Well, I don't know how, maybe you're, I don't know what you did, but this is how it works. Just do it in two lines. Sometimes methods need to run. Um, like if you're doing a, and this, Well, if it works, then it's good. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, well, that's because you're creating the hungry list outside of it. Yeah, okay, so that's a complete, okay, good. That's a very good example, Jessica. Let me show you what's going on there. Um, so if you have hungry list to find before the function, which is not really what we want to do everything in the function. This is if we if we create an empty hungry list right here, you're creating a global variable. And that's not really what we want to do here, because we want to receive the list right here. Um, technically, uh, because lists are mutable, and it's global, you would be able to append to it. So if you append Yeah, exactly. I, I don't like that way. Um, I would just say do it in two things. Generally with methods, like when it runs a method, that's like running a function call. It's similar to a function call. And so usually it needs, sometimes it needs a line to itself. Um, yeah. Anyways, I'm going to move on. I don't, I would just say do it this way. Um, Really, we're just diving into detail. Yeah, the list is defined in the parameter. That's correct. So you can't really make it a global in this situation. All right. Hopefully that kind of answered questions and didn't make everybody more confused. Can we do the next one? Yeah. I mean, I was just going to go over um, let me let me just go over a generic thing first, and then I'll go into these things. Okay. <laughs> let me do that first, and then we can do all the assignments you guys want. Not really, just within a, a lot of time. <laughs> all right. Um, so, how do you guys feel about while loops? While loops, anybody? We're gonna do them. I don't care. All right. So, while loops are. <laughs> They're like if statements that get repeated a bunch until a condition is met. Okay. Um, when do we use them? We use while loops when we do not know how many times code needs to be repeated. Um, so much like an if statement, you're, you're in an if else statement, you're creating structure for your code to run when you don't exactly know what the conditions are going to be, whether it's going to be in the if condition or the else condition before it runs, you don't know, maybe. And so it's like that. You just have this thing that needs to be looped, but only if the condition is met. All right. So while loops are for that. All right, so much like an if, let's make a variable name, Santa is away. Let's just say it's true, cross our fingers. And, um, oh, sh okay, okay. <laughs> Touche. Uh, and so if we had an if statement, we would just say if Santa is away, uh, print 
Yay. All right. Seeing a theme here. Um, and so if we run this right now, it's going to say, whoops, because Santa is here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right, so much like an if else statement, all we would have to do is change the if, and you kind of don't need the else anymore, although while else does exist in this language. Um, while Santa is away, yay. Um, so this is gonna be an infinite loop right now. So one of the things with while loops is they are dangerous. Avoid infinite loops by making sure you have, I can't see because this thing is, okay. All right, so right now if I ran this code, I would make this thing die. And I don't actually know how to stop it on this particular thing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, just change it to false. So it only runs once. So if you have a while, so the cool thing about while loops is they loop zero or more times. So if, if this was false right here from the get-go, um, we'd never ever enter that while loop. See, we don't see any output there. Um, so while loops are very dynamic there. You don't, you might not know what your variable, your condition is going to be and while loops support it. So um, maybe you don't need to do whatever is going to happen here. Maybe you had like some mathematical thing. And if, if it was a negative number, you need to like process it somehow. Well, if it's a positive number, you never even need to do any processing. So it's kind of cool like that. Um, yeah, everybody make sure you're on all panelists and attendees. I mean, you Santa. <laughs> He's not used to being a chat person. Um, all right. Everybody on board with that part? So zero more times and based on a condition. Um, you can do it with count. Well, count is less than three. And then you could do like count plus equals one. Did somebody have bad language? All right, so now anyways, this whole loop is many times and we have, so generally when you're trying to loop a certain amount of times you have an external variable like outside of your loop that's going to change and change the such that the condition will eventually escape. You know, you're going to have an exit to your while loop eventually. Um, everybody on board with that? I mean, I think we've seen this one. Um, another way to exit a while loop is um, you can use a return statement. Like maybe you have a function or something that is so small that, well, the return is always gonna get you out of a function. It, as soon as your function sees the return statement, it leaves the function and just returns whatever it does. So in this case, um, I'm gonna change this to 10 so we actually see it, but basically on the fifth time, this is gonna leave but I'm not in a function, so this is gonna be really confusing. <laughs> All right, now we have a function and All right, so now this will do the thing. And then at the very end, we exit before it hits this condition by using a return statement. 
So there's a lot of other, there's ways to do that. Another way you could do it is do something called break. Um, that'll exit the current loop that you're in. Um, you can Google that one if you need to. Um, there's cases for it. It just, it's the same thing. It just exits the loop and kicks you out back to the end of it. Um, why here did you init the while loop? The while loop is indented because it's all inside the function. Remember, everything that's inside your function has to be indented. Um, so this stuff, everything after here is inside the function. And then this next level of indentation is saying everything is in the while loop. And this next level of indentation is saying this is what runs if the if statement is met. So you always just have one more level of indentation for the blocks of code that you need. And then could you have kept the return without making it a function? You do not use return statements without a function. Return is a keyword specifically designed to be used with functions. It's saying this function has some input maybe, but it, the output is gonna be what's returned. So that's why I had to make a function real quick. Everybody on board so far? Um, generally while loops, um, they're powerful because they're dynamic and you could have some kind of condition that uh, you might not know, like if you're pulling information from the web, you don't know what kind of stuff you're going to be pulling from there. Um, you, and it's going to be dynamic. And so you have to have code that will maybe handle stuff. Um, so they're kind of cool for looping in that sense, but they're dangerous if you are not extremely careful with having a good exit condition or a return statement or a break statement or something. At the end of the function, isn't yet. Um, if the end of the function isn't met, could you do another return? Yeah, so if this didn't happen, we could do return wow. Um, so I could just change this condition to 15, so it's never going to be met. And so it's never going to hit this one. And then because of that, the while loop will actually complete and we'll meet the ending condition here. And then we'll exit the while loop normally and we'll say return wow this time. So there's actually a thing for that. Okay, so as soon as return is run, the function is terminated. Um, yeah, so if a break is run, it just kicks you out of the while loop. You're done with it. So maybe you use a break statement in this situation if you were done changing this count variable or something and you weren't ready to return some data from the function yet. Maybe you had a little bit more processing to do. So then you would use break to kick yourself out of the while loop. And then you would, you know, we could just do that real quick. And we could just say uh, count plus equals 12. And then return count instead. Um, yep. So that's how those things work. Um, again, if you're gonna use a while loop, just be really careful. <laughs> that you have an exit condition. And generally the way you do that is you have some kind of variable that is defined outside of the loop that will be changing that will, or, and then you'll either have a break or return or you'll make sure your condition is met, but you need to make sure that works. <laughs> be careful. Um, I think depending on what, like if you're in the terminal, I think control or command C usually kicks you out of it if it freezes up in your infinite loop. Um, it depends on different uh, operating systems. All right, everybody good at while loops? Or good enough? Break exits the while loop. So as soon as it sees this, just like a return, as soon as a function sees a return statement, it exits the function. A break says, I'm not gonna break out of the if statement. It says, I'm gonna break out of the nearest loop. So if it's a while loop or a for loop, it says, I'm gonna get out of this guy and then go on to whatever's after it. Something cool is um, there's also like a while else statement, which is a little more advanced, but um, this says if the while loop completes normally and it, it finishes and exits normally, it didn't hit a break or return, it just finishes the while loop. Um, it'll go in this else statement afterwards my loop completed normally. 
and then it'll show that. So it's kind of like how, and you might not necessarily need this normally. You really probably wouldn't, which is why it's kind of a little bit more advanced. Um, because normally if you finish a while loop, um, you could just put stuff after it without having the else block and this will all get run. But there are some cases where you might have a break statement or another thing where this thing just completes normally and those might have to have different um, things that happen. If the loop completes normally, like if this was a timer and we ran out of time, then maybe the else statement would be at the end said, I ran out of time, I need to like do something else. Whereas if it braked or returned, then it was already finished. So um, it's just another level of complexity and you really probably don't need to worry about that one for a while. Any other questions about while loops? So the break statement means it will run through the while loop once, and then once it sees break, it will exit regardless. Yeah, so if it gets to break, note though, first, remember how I said while loops, they don't even have to go into the while loop. So first, this condition has to be met, count zero, so it goes into the while loop. And then um, it will, uh, go into the if statement inside the while loop and this has to be met. So it has to actually reach the line of break. Um, if it does that, then it will kick out of the while loop, but it'll still be in the function. Does that make sense? I'm gonna change this up real quick. Good. I'm gonna do a quick example for you guys. I don't even want the definition. Okay, so let me go to this beautiful website called pythontutor.com just to show you guys what's happening. Oh, whoops, unexpected indent, my bad. All right, so this is a website that helps you step through the code and kind of figure out um, what's going on. So this line right here, the red arrow is going to be the, the line the code is currently executing and it's going to show you variables and things. So first step, we set a variable, a new variable called count, set it equals zero. And here's that variable right here. And then we go into the while loop. Note that we haven't actually gone straight into the while loop yet. We first check and see if this condition is met before we go in. Like I said, count is zero. So zero is less than three. We go in, we print yay. There's the output. And then we add one to count afterwards. We see it increment. And so what happens next is it goes back to that first while line, which is like another if statement. I'm like, well, am I still less than three? Count is currently one, one is less than three. So we're like, yep, good to go. Then we go into this line and this line. We change count again to two after we print yay. And then same thing happens one last time. And this time counts three. And so this final time, three is not less than three. And so we just exit the while loop. So that's a cool visual thing. Um, I recommend you guys play with this for both while loops and for loops to kind of get the feel for it. Everybody good? It is a cool site. It's important to be able to debug your code. This is called stepping through your code. It's the thing you, when you have a bug, Generally, you have to step through your code and see that all your, all your, because as programmers, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have errors, and most of those errors are going to be based on assumptions like, well, I think my, or I expect my variable to be this way or that way or something, but in actuality, it might be something different because you had a brain fart. So it's really good to learn how to step through your code or, I mean, use print statements for debug maybe, but not in production, no print statements get rid of them after you figure out the problem. Um, but yeah, th this website's really good for understanding how loops work. All right, any other questions on while loops? Good, too bad if it's not, <laughs> just kidding. Um, all right, let's dive into lists and then for loops and then we'll do assignments. All right, lists, so Lists are a collection. They store things. 
I store other objects and pieces of data. All right. Um, they are mutable and they are ordered and heterogeneous. Um, so first, let's just talk about lists. Let's call it, let's make a list. To make a list, you can just drop some square brackets there. And what it does is it's, it's, it's useful for storing, well, generally, okay, ultimately you are designing the code. So when I'm making a list, I generally put things that should, you know, logically be grouped together, but you can put whatever the heck you want in a list and have an organized bedroom or something, you know? Um, but generally you're gonna try and put things that make sense to be grouped together. Um, they are ordered. And so if you add something to a list, it will keep that order. Um, mutable means it's changeable. You can always change what's in the list. It's not permanent. And so in your code, you have to like, if you're working with other programmers and you're kind of using the same list, you don't want somebody like messing with your list if, <laughs> if you, and you not know it because then it might mess up your code. So you kind of have to be a little bit careful with mutable things. Um, but generally it won't be an issue because you'll just use it and don't care about it after that. So let's talk about heterogeneous first. Um, in your list, you can store a bunch of things like integers, strings, uh, booleans, none, whatever. So let's just say, hello people, and then the number one. Um, that's fine. You can do whatever you want in a list pretty much. Um, they are useful for, like I said, like if you have a bunch of emails or things that like groceries, I think we use that example a lot. Um, apples and oranges, you could treat it just like a shopping list or something, you know. Um, and the order is going to be the same. Uh, it's useful in a lot of ways. You're going to just use lists all the time um, because you just do. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's just get into using them. Um, I'm trying to think of a good, is a table a list? Um, kind of, like, it depends what you mean by table. Like, a list is a collection. And so let me just, uh, and socks. Um, so let's just dive into it. So it's kind of like a table in the sense that it has these indexes associated with the position of each of the things in the list. Okay. So you could kind of treat it like a table in the sense that the thing at location zero is apples. The thing at location one is oranges. Um, so that's all good. Note that these are indexes and indexes are zero based. So you have to unlearn how your parents taught you how to count and start with zero with most programming languages. Um, this can be kind of confusing for people um, because when you think about like element one, that's, that sounds really ambiguous um, if you're describing it to somebody else. Like, do you mean element one, like the first element or element at position or index one? Um, so I would encourage you to always, when you're describing it, be clear. Um, just say like element at index zero or the way I described it, uh, like this is the first element, second. When you start using words like this, you're you're not going to be able to make a mistake because the first element is always element zero. Um, notably, I know there was some panic about uh, the reading about indexes. Well, I have very good news. If I can find it, it exists now. Um, See, 
all this stuff. It exists now. <laughs> Anyways, um, generally, I like to refer to either, like I said, first, second, third, whatever. Um, because yeah, it's kind of ambiguous. If they say position one, index I feel like is clear. When people use the word index, I know they're talking about zero based. Position could be misinterpreted though, I feel. So I always just say index or first, second, third. Um, so try and follow that one. All right. So if we want to add groceries, we've got, so first of all, let's just print it out. Um, it looks exactly like how we have it here. So wonderful. Not a big deal. We could also have um, another list and we could do, we could define it literally. And just put all these. So another list is just going to be empty. Yep. That's the exact same, same as doing Correct. Uh, this is doing it literally. I don't really, or this is doing it literally. I mean, uh, I don't really ever do it this way. Um, can, but I like explicitly saying what I want to do. Um, just because it's more readable. And with this, like you have to append everything one, um, whereas you can just start with everything in position here. Um, but let's keep going. Um, so if we want to add to another list or my list, we just do the list name dot append and I'm going to do true. And so now if we we're still printing it right after that, and now it's on the list. Note that it append is always in the last position. Um, just like it would be if you're appending to a book or something. Um, Everybody on board with appending and creating lists so far? How do you add more than one? Okay, that's a very good question, David. You cannot append more than one. However, however, you can do um, new list equals uh, my list plus groceries, for example. And then we could print new list. And now new list has two lists added together. And so that's kind of the equivalent of appending more than one. It's the only way to do it. Good. Great. Um, <laughs> So that's pretty cool. You can just add two lists together and then it combines them. Note that this one is first and this one is second. So it comes out like that in the order of the items on the list. Groovy. All right, so what else? This list is way too long. Going back to our append return problem. Return running through question. Well, I think what's happening is it's it's trying to run that line of code, the method there for a pin at the same time, and it's not like finished with it when it's trying to turn it. I'm not really sure. Um, I I just know how to make it work. I don't. <laughs> I didn't make Python. <laughs> um, so I would just say do it in two lines and let that thing go. <laughs> Santa might know that one. I, I, I don't. Um, when in doubt, for example, um, Python return append to list. Let's just see if someone else has had this problem. Allow Python list append. Okay, so this person probably wants to, okay, importantly, list does not return the modified list. This returns a new list. Oh, it's just, okay, so basically the moral of the story is when in doubt, uh, me saying that nobody's gonna know everything, just Google whatever you need to as you go. 
Stack Overflow community generally has most of the answers or the Python documentation. I encourage all of you, I mean, you're all here right now, so you're all actually trying to learn programming. You have to become good at Googling those like oddball questions, you know, those things that, you know, or just test it out. Like if, if you have a thought and you're like, I wonder if you can append multiple things to this, just try it in REPL and uh, find out. Uh, it, you have to like have fun learning Python, otherwise you're gonna go crazy. So you have to just explore it. But I do encourage the questions at the same time. I'm just saying like, if we're not doing this uh, webinar, feel free to Google stuff, get good at it because every programmer is every, every programming job is 50% Googling. I'd probably say when, if you're doing something new. Yeah, I think that's correct. Parl. Not every method returns. <laughs> all right. So, all right, let's keep going. Let me get rid of this junk. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that the append, yeah, that's, that's actually it. Yeah. Append method does not actually have a return in it. I don't even know what that stands for. Uh, yeah, I don't think it has a return in it. I really should have thought about that. And some methods don't. Oh, okay. I've never seen that one. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so I think that method for a pin does not have a return statement. And so it needs to be run on its own line to change the list. And then you can return the whole list after the operation is done. But if you're, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If it's, if it's returning none, that means it doesn't have a return. All right, so mystery solved, guys. <laughs> Even I can get stumped for a second. Um, all right, continuing. Uh, let's look at how to remove stuff. Like, what if we don't want socks? <laughs> um, I don't know why you wouldn't want socks. It's getting cold. Um, socks are great. So, what if we wanted to? So, you can do groceries dot remove socks. Let me just get rid of these other lists for a second. And it's gone. So remove is cool in the sense that um, you can just plug in the thing, the string or whatever you're looking for. If I have the number 12, I think that should still work. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a string member because lists are heterogeneous. You can just pick it. And if I had two instances of 12, it would only return remove the first one. So here it is first, and then the, the second one kind of survived that horrible incident of removing it. Um, everybody on board with that? Remove is pretty cool, uh, because then you don't have to count the index and figure out where things are. You can just get rid of it. Um, but what if you try and do like, 13 here, it's not on this list. You're gonna get an error. Um, so when you use remove, you need to be careful and make sure whatever you're trying to remove, despite the fact that you don't have to count to find the element, you still have to make sure it exists in the list first. So if um, 13 in groceries, it's not here. Jerk. All right, cool. So we tried to remove 13. It wasn't there, so we didn't want to get the error, so we have an if-else statement. And so now your code's not going to error and nobody's going to freak out. Everybody on board with that? Going to assume yes. All right, uh, let's continue. <laughs> um, if we want, okay, so we can also do pop. Okay, pop is kind of like remove. I'm gonna get rid of this whole thing for a second. And so let's get rid of socks. And so remember, we wanna get, like if I said, um, 
if I said that I want to get rid of socks, or if I want, I said I want to get rid of the fourth element or the third index or socks, you have three ways to really think about it. Um, but pop uses index, so we know it's in three, and socks are gone. Pretty cool. Now. Um, we could do like socks index equals groceries dot index of socks. And then we could print that out. And then we could just use that variable here. So maybe we still don't want to count, for example. Um, we find out it's three and then we remove three. Um, this is horribly inefficient though, because remove would do the exact same thing. <laughs> but it's cool to be comfortable enough with these things um, to realize you can do it both ways. One other thing I want to show you guys real quick is that, let me just get rid of this part. Um, there you go. So you can also go kind of backwards if I can count. Um, so the last element on your list is always going to be negative one. So if I print it out, we're gonna get socks. If I print out negative two, we're gonna get pairs. Um, pretty straightforward. So yeah, if we wanna access things, all we do is we put the index for the list inside the square brackets next to your list name, and you can print it out or do whatever you want with it or access it. Um, you can remove, you can pop, you can append. Does Python understand the word fourth? No, that's like a human readable thing. Um, for kind of trying to communicate to some other programmer or something which element it is. Um, right, it's, it's something you have to learn the hard way and, and you have to be very explicit with. Um, the fourth element is the third index. And so if you look on this, I kind of tried to simplify it for you guys. So you've got the index and you've got the word for the order, and I just say take the word fourth, subtract one from it, or change it to number four, and you get the index. And then if you follow that rule of thumb, you'll probably be okay. All right, hold on a second here. All right, cool. All right, um, let's, 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 what else? So you can't, Ray, you can't put um, the item in quotes right here like that. Uh, we don't actually teach this in this course, but we have another type of collection that's accessed kind of similar to that where you can put a string here, um, but we're not gonna cover that in the free course. What about, so if we wanted to pull the index of the item though, you would just do this right here. Um, basically you would get the index of socks and then you would print groceries um, socks index. Does that make sense? Cool. So that's most of the stuff you do. Let me think, hold on, let me read through. We got adding, checking existence. Oh yeah, in. Um, so when you're doing um, remove, for example, I think I kind of showed you this, but like, yeah, I did the in with the, I did that, Never mind. Uh, existence, removing, index. And then for loops, okay, let's do it. So we've got this thing here and we wanna go through it 
and say we want to print out each of these things one at a time. So we want to make a for loop to iterate through the list. Iterating means kind of going through one item at a time in this case and pulling these out as variables one at a time every time a loop runs and have it change. So if I say for a grocery item and groceries, again, and note how I use plural for my list name that's going to hold things. And then I try and have like the singular version of it here. It makes it really human readable and it makes all your programmer friends that you either don't, that you're going to have in the future uh, really happy when they're reading your code. So all I want to do is print grocery item. And so what's going to happen is it's going to go through this um, and kind of like we did with the while loop. In fact, I'll show you that in a second. I'll, I'll run it here. It prints out these items one at a time so that you could then do something with them. Uh, maybe you've got a whole bunch of numbers and you have to like do some kind of math um, with all of the numbers. Uh, let me just show you guys this real quick. Let's edit code and visualize. So we've got our, so we see the list, we see the indexes here, and then the very first time this runs, it sets the grocery item as the variable apples because it's the first one in the list. Then if I go forward, we go back up, we print it, we run the print line, and then it goes on here, it's gonna jump to oranges now for the next item. So grocery items is oranges. And then so on and so forth, one at a time. Um, so everybody on board with that. So for loops are great because they help you go through these items one at a time without having to do complicated stuff. Um, notably, these all have indexes and remember that thing um, called range. Um, let's just, okay, hold on a sec, uh, let's see here. You could also do for um, number in range. Well, we know this is going up to three. So actually, hold on, let's just a uh, list of um, one second. All right, so if we do that and we uh, print list of nums, it creates a list, range does. There's not a dog, oh, there's a, okay, there might have been a dog outside. There's a dog walking place right out there. All right, uh, so this will create a list from zero up to one less than this number. And so technically, this looks exactly like our indexes. So technically, we could um, for number in list of in range for print um, groceries num. And so what this will do is it's going to do the same thing, but it's going to access them using the index here instead. But again, this is much less readable because you have to think about it. You have to think zero to three, and then this is gonna print, and then you have to kind of think about what all these things are. Whereas if you just do a for loop, it's really intuitive because instead of just having this variable named num that you're using to access the index, you have grocery item, a more meaningful name. Um, it's just, we want you, we don't want you to do this way, but you kind of, it can be helpful um, to know this kind of way, maybe not for iterating through a list, but just for, remember how in while loops, um, we didn't know how many times it was gonna repeat, zero more? Well, for loops, we do know how many times it's gonna repeat. So maybe you just have to print hello 
three or four times. Um, and we don't really care about the variable name, so we're just going to put that as a placeholder. This is great. For loops, if you use range, if you just want to repeat something four times or a number of times, that's where you use range. If you're trying to iterate through a list, do it like this. Everybody on board? Still? Maybe? Bueller? Cool. Um, so mutable, it means the lists can change. They can be changed at any point. That means we can append to them, remove from them. Um, it just it just says be careful if you if you're if you got different functions using the same list, like make sure they don't change it too much or something. How can you iterate through a list and find duplicates? Um, you can remove them with a set um, collection, but we're not going to get into that today. So, uh, Basically, what you'd have to do is, let me see here. If I were doing that and I wasn't using set and I was trying to find duplicates, I would probably um, make, iterate through a list and I'd have a secondary list that um, I would create and I would, um, let me show you with my words, <laughs> with my code. So like, if you wanted to do that, um, let's just say we have pairs again. I would um, uh, temp list. I'd make an empty list, and for grocery item and groceries, I would temp list .pend. and I would basically say if a uh, grocery item not in temp list, I would put it there. And if it is already in there, when we get there, print um, grocery item is a duplicate. with a space. And then if I said oranges. So basically what I did is I created another list and I just used the in function to check if it was there. Does that make sense to you, David? All right, let me explain it one more time. I built a secondary list that I knew was only going to have one of each of these values in it, kind of like key and so the first time this runs through here it's going to say apples apples is in the list it's going to put this in my new list and it's going to do that just fine for these first four because these are all the first time but when it hits its first duplicate in the for loop it's going to say pairs is the grocery item so it's going to say is, is pairs in the grocery temp list it is already in here and so i just want to print it out and say it's a duplicate And then it would do the same for oranges. Does that make sense? Um, there's a lot of different ways to solve the same problems uh, or solve lots of things. Uh, that's just what I came up with off the top of my head. Okay. Um, let's, let me just verify there's nothing else. Let me do one more cool for loop thing. And then we'll kind of move on to assignments briefly. So if I wanted to do the average, is there even a, hold on, let me check something. Oh, there is an average one. Okay, well, that's what we're going to do real quick. Do you guys understand this one? Whoa. I'm going to do two problems and maybe some other ones. Um, so we're getting a list of numbers and we want to get the average. So we don't know how big that list is going to be. Um, and we need to first figure out how we're going to do that. So average is calculated by average is the sum of all the numbers 
divided by the number of numbers. All right. So if we were to translate that into code, we would take the sum of everything in the list and we divide that by, how do we get the number of all the things in the list? Anybody? Length, perfect. Length, list of numbers. Okay, and so we want to use, um, technically we could just do sum on our list and, and be really fancy because the, that's how the sum function works, but um, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to do for number in list of numbers. Notice that I have good naming here again. And I have to keep track of my variable outside of the for loop. Generally, you're going to be keeping track of variables outside the for loop. Um, because if you had some defined here inside the for loop, it would reset every time the for loop loops and restart at zero and you'd never get the sum because it would just be, well, it wouldn't be an infinite thing. It would just only be the, 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 the last number that it ran because it would restart at zero and then, right? Um, so generally with loops, you want to define your variables outside of it. All right, so we're going to do sum plus equals number. And then once it's finished, it's done. It'll add all those numbers together in your list of numbers. And then finally, we can do average equals um, the sum. Notice that I'm taking the average after it's unindented. So I'm saying after the for loop is completed, all the numbers have been added to the variable sum. And afterwards, I'm just going to do sum divided by the length of list of numbers. So let me steal this piece of code. Oh, I called it total instead of sum. Whatever. It is better to use the word total instead of sum because sum is a keyword and I don't like to overwrite keywords. What have I done? Uh, okay, so pass. All right, Jason, that's a good question. Assert is just for testing. It's saying this side of the equation has to be equal to this side. Otherwise, you get an assertion error. So it's going to say error. It's like a must thing. I'm surprised the dog is that audible for you guys. Um, all right, so total of zero for nominal listeners. Oh, I didn't return it. That's silly. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, sorry, Jason. Um, so basically, assert, you're not really going to have to worry about that. That's more for like unit tests and things, testing to make sure your function works. We're calling the function on this side. It's, it's saying whatever you put after the assert statement has to be true. In this case, we're saying we have equal equal. So we're saying both of these two sides um have to match and so this adds up to 21 and we're getting the average and there's three things so it's seven so when this function runs we expect if we with this input this particular list of numbers the answer should return seven that's what it starts saying and we're using that in our little test thing right here okay so when the tests are run pass oops um uh, if i have like my function and I don't want to write anything yet. I just write pass. Pass is a placeholder um, for when you haven't written something yet. Because if I had like some code right here, um, if you didn't have the word pass here and you still hadn't written your function, Python sees this colon here and it expects an indented block of code for your function definition. And so if it sees this and then it sees unindented code afterwards, it's like, well, there's nothing in my function. There's a problem. So pass is like a placeholder saying, I'll write that stuff later. Uh, where is list of numbers defined? List of numbers is received as a parameter. So in this case, when we run our function call here in this assert statement, we're sending this list of five, 10, six, two list of numbers and it's received. And so it's like saying list of numbers equals Five, ten, six. 
right here. Make sense? Let's uh, let's run this. What do you mean? Not if list of numbers isn't right there. It is right there. So I don't understand your question. Well, help me understand what your problem is. I can explain it to you. So when you are like you have it as an argument, but it's not, it's defined right here. So when you have, this is your function definition. Um, this is your function definition, this right here. It's saying when the function is called later, it will receive something as a parameter here. In this case, it's this list, all right? Um, and then when it sees this, it expects it, David. Uh, I can use these parameters anywhere within this function definition. They are local to this function definition. It's saying I'm going to receive a variable here and I have to, if I, if like, if I delete this right here, when I run this, it's going to give me an error. It says it takes one argument and it, and zero were provided. Okay. So it's saying whatever the first thing is here is going to be matched with this. And it's the equivalent, like I said, of saying this because it just sends this over here. It says, I'm going to store whatever you send the first thing here in this variable name and it's the equivalent of doing this. So it's not a list until the parameter is defined in line 10. Yeah. So basically this could, you, you might send a string here instead of this list. This, this parameter name is suggesting that it should be a list <laughs> if, if you're not a, you know, crazy coder. Um, hold on, there's a bunch of questions. Let me catch up, guys. Um, after you get average. Okay, hold on. This chat window is terrible. Whoops, and then I just lost it. Hold on, let me catch up to you guys. Uh, list of numbers, yeah, list of numbers is a placeholder. I think the question is, how does it know five, six is the list you wanna put in list of numbers? Yeah, so basically, it doesn't matter what this, this data type is. All right, it's saying whatever you send here as the argument and your function call is going to be stored in list of numbers. In this case, it just happens to be this list and that's it. You could, once again, you could send a string here or a Boolean and then this code would really not work because you'd be trying to send a for loop or have a for loop run on that. Um, so yeah, this is the function name. This is the parameter, the parameter is received from the function call. Argument becomes attached to the parameter based on order. Yes, okay, so this is a list. It's all one thing. Remember, you're not sending get average five. It's not like num1, comma, num2. It's not like this. It's not like num1, num2, num3. It's just a list, it's one piece of information. So just because a list has three things in it, it's still one collection, one kind of object. Okay, cool. Did I get all the other questions there? That was a lot of text. All right, well, that's, that's a good question then. Great. All right, I'm going to move on to another one. Uh, I'll do like one or two more assignments probably and then we'll probably call it. Any particular ones? First, second, third. 
Okay. Let me see what this says. I haven't seen this one in a second. Insert human. Oh yeah. Okay. So we want Okay, so first, second, third, last. Okay, you got it. Um, let me just run the code. So it looks like um, we've got a list and I believe that we only need to care about, yeah, three positions. So this is an if statement. Okay, we're gonna do if um, position equals uh, first, then we're gonna do something. Um, we'll do list one, a list dot insert um, hold on one second. I don't ever use insert. What's the syntax? 0x. Okay, perfect. Um, where'd I go? Let me do it on here. So we just say put insert 0 and then L. Assuming I had the order right. Yep. And then we do elif because there's only one option. Remember, that's exclusive. I need to do this faster. Don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I'll do those other ones in a second. So second, third, and then last. And we know that that's going to be minus one, zero, one, two. And then, so if we run it, Let's just steal this code. See if I did it right. Yep. Except. Well, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah, I need to do length on this one. There we go. Um, yeah, is would be correct. Uh, it, it'd be better than this because we're using text here and it's human readable. Uh, Santa would approve of that. You just said that. I'm sure Santa does approve. Um, it looks like it, okay, so what it did was it returned the position of this one, right? So minus one, the list is only three right now. And so it's gonna be this index two in this case, and it was gonna insert it there. We are trying, when we do last, we're trying to create a new one after it. So minus one wouldn't work in that case. I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> All right, everybody good with this one? It's just a big if, elif, 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 elif. Okay, let's do um, get search match indexes and then the first one. 
Oh, that's no, the same one. This one's tricky. It's kind of deceptive. Oh my gosh, did I miss it? There it is. Okay, so this one's not intuitive. Uh, I, I put it in there as a curveball because I'm kind of evil. All right, uh, <laughs> let me let me just get this. Um, Well, I encourage you to Google. That's part of programming. All right, so let's, so what's going to happen here is in this test case, um, we have suspicious twice in our list. Remember. Like when we do the index, it'll only get the first one of these. So like, because I've planted this trap for you guys, it's a trap. Um, you might be able to get the index of the first one, but you can't just do dot index and, and actually get the second one. So you have to be kind of clever about how you do this guy because it's, it's tricky. Um, so, the answer is we know how indexes work. We know it starts with zero. And while using the dot index or yeah, dot index could be nice. Um, ultimately we can count it and build it ourselves. And that's what we have to do. Um, so we need to do, let me read that again real quick. We're going to a new list. All right, so we're going to do result list. Now I want to call it frisky list. I don't know. That sounds weird. Um, and so we're going to create an empty list. <laughs> Maybe I should call it frisk. I don't know. And so basically, our goal is to populate this list with just the indexes. Well, Check this out. First of all, we can do a for loop to go through for frisked. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to call it frisked thing. OK, and list being frisk. Um, we can first of all just you know print it out just like by using our for loop. I'm going to get rid of this for a second. Um, and I need to do a function call. All right. So first of all, what have I done? I need to give it a search term. My bad. Wait, I think I did that. Oh. This is what happens when you go too fast with copy and paste. Okay, so the first thing you notice is, hey, this is element zero, this is one, this is two, and this is three. We can get it printed out. And we don't really have to use some kind of magic Python feature to do this. All we have to do, this is gonna blow your minds, but sometimes coding is as simple as you let it be. We're just gonna do something called index count equals zero. Um, and <laughs> all we're going to do is inside here, if first thing is suspicious, um, frisky list dot append index count. And then all we do is we make sure we in increment that inside the for loop. All right, are your minds blown? So now I just need to return that. And then print this out. But there's a better way, and I'm going to show you that. So look, one and three. 
So yeah, like I said, the in your intuition probably says try and use dot index or whatever, but we know because of the readings that are there now and Google and all these things and our knowledge of Python, um, that it only gets the first item. And so we had to come up with our own method to figure it out. Um, and we do that just because we know how counting works. We can kind of model it with our code and make another variable and do that. I'm gonna blow your minds again because I don't know. I'm gonna get rid of that variable. And I'm gonna do something called enumerate. And I'm gonna do index. Oh yeah. <laughs> and what this does is, I'm gonna print this out real quick. Enumerate pairs the index with that element in your list so that you can just go through here and get whatever element or index it is based on this. And so what you do is you have a for loop, but you have two things in it separated by a comma. And the first one's gonna be your index and the second one's gonna be whatever the element is. Pretty cool. Um, everybody follow? Uh, enumerate's not really something we really dive into too deeply in this course. Um, it's just cool to know it exists. Um, and I don't use it all the time, but I know how to use it or how to Google how to use it. Um, one of the most important things about programming is not knowing everything, but it's knowing the things exist that you can go Google and find and use as you do. All right, enumerate. What it does is, um, let me try and explain that again, because I go, I went pretty fast. All we do is we put that, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> I muted the second one, I'm getting good at this. Thank you. Um, so what it does is it pairs the index with the item and it lists. Sometimes it's useful, like in this case. Um, where we need the index. Um, so I've kind of shown you guys here, it's getting them at the same time. So when we find that word that's matching, we've already got the index that's associated with it without having to do anything or having to make a count variable like I did at first. It's kind of getting a pair of index and elements at the same time, just by putting enumerate around your list inside your for loop and having these two items here. Um, I just recommend Googling it, some examples for it. You, you, you're not really gonna need to use it anytime soon probably, so don't worry about it too hard. Everybody good? What do you guys think about these weird assignments? <laughs> too weird, too frisky? Good. I tried to make it interesting for you guys. Um, How did you guys do with the list challenge? Well, that's the goal, challenging and fun. Good. I wonder if I should do this. Oh, wow, that's a list comprehension. That's a little bit, and that's a little bit more advanced, David, <laughs> but that's pretty cool. That does work. No, 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 no. I know it works. I'm just saying that's, that's usually an advanced topic. <laughs> List comprehensions are very difficult for a lot of people to wrap their minds around. It took me a while to get them. Um, should we do the list challenge? We're gonna do the list challenge and then that's it. All right, final thing. We're gonna do this and then I'm gonna set you guys free. Um, all right, so I've already read this. So we've just got some random variables. 
Yeah, it was kind of a cumulative thing about the stuff you've learned. Um, all right, so the first thing we need to do is create a list in the variable list one that's already kind of made for us. And we need to give it some data. Summer, a bunch of ones and zeros. Fall, oops. Um, list two, kind of the same thing. I had to do some setup. Uh, cake. Oh. I probably could just copy and paste this. I've made an egregious mistake. Okay. That's better. Okay, so basically the first thing things are we just creating lists with all the data that I said to put in there. This one, we're just creating an empty list. Hopefully you guys can do that. And so, again, this can be tricky if you're thinking about indexes, but like I said, if I use the keyword second here, which means that's gonna be element one, or index one. So, um, secret message dot append, and we're gonna do uh, list three, element one, index one, at the second item, because it starts at zero and then it goes to one. Everybody on board so far? Okay, I feel like I say that a lot. Uh, pop the third item. See, again, I said the word third, which means index two, because index is order minus one, okay? Pop the third item from list two. Um, one thing about pop is um, it actually returns whatever you pop out of the list, it returns it. So you can do this in one line, unlike a pin, because there's a return. And these are kind of things that you just have to familiarize yourself with. Um, pop the third item, so two. Okay. Write an if statement checking if the length of the list is two. If length list two equals four. For numbers, I usually use equal equal. Oops. Um, secret message dot append var two. Else um, secret message dot append the first item of list two to the secret message. Everybody good still? All right. Create a list in the variable list four with the last element from list three in it. All right, so I can do list three and I can just do minus one. All right, another if statement, we're almost there. Um, <sighs> the reason I did it like this is because you kind of have to get everything right at once to understand what's happening. So it's really like a test. Um, a pin the last one is four. A pin list one minus one. Um, so yeah, we, this is the same thing. You can use shorthand when you're adding two lists together. This is the same thing as doing secret message equals secret message plus list four. 
And it does matter, again, the order that you add the two lists together. So secret message had to be the first one. What did I do of our theory? All right. If cake in secret message. Oh my God. <laughs> um, secret message dot pub. The fifth item, so that's four. And then secret message dot pop. The fourth item is, is three. Um, so David, when you're doing lists, you only use this when you're um, creating a list, like you're doing this, the brackets start to create a list or to access a list. So in here we're accessing the item from list three, the second item from list three and doing that. Whereas in this case, this is a method. Pop and append are methods. Um, length is a function. Um, and so function, functions and methods are gonna receive parameters usually, or arguments, I mean. And so this is saying, I'm gonna call the pop method on secret message and I'm gonna send it for. And so that's when, and so for those methods and functions are when you use the, um, Parentheses. Yep. Okay. So if that's there, otherwise, append the fourth item. Fourth item plus three. Geez, this is convoluted. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, so again, the fourth item is index three. This was really made to test you guys on your index knowledge. All right, um, and then create a list in the variable list five with the second element of list two. So that's gonna be one. And then puppies, aw, and then var one. And then finally write a for loop um, for item in list five. And it says, pins all the words that aren't puppies. So we'll just do if item is not equal to puppies, or we could say is not, if you want to be cool about it, is not puppies secret message dot append um, item. Makes sense. Let's see if I didn't screw it up because I don't know. I think I need to print it. Hold on. Oh, there we go. This object is not callable on line 60. Oh, I put it in. <laughs> Whoops. I did exactly what I was telling you not to do. Hey, that's what happens when you code live, you know? Hey, look, what's that say? I know it's true. It's totally true. That's it. Uh, Remoter made me fall in love with lists. See now how hard it was to code that so it was all convoluted so it wasn't obvious. Um, does everyone understand all those concepts there? Um, it's kind of tricky. I am happy. Why wouldn't I be happy? It worked. Um, so David, with programming, it's all about getting it to work the first time. And then maybe once you understand how it works, then you learn about elegance and like maybe a better way to write it. I want to encourage you guys, um, there's this button on here, right here 
on all of the problems. And you can click on this, it's a little GitHub button. And basically what happens is you can go to solutions and there's your solution. So if you wanna see how we did it, all you do is you click on the GitHub and you go in the solutions folder. I think we normally have a solution. Okay, maybe this works, let's see. I don't think I was working earlier. It works on the, yeah, it works on the main course. I don't know why it's not. Well, anyways, um, that's how you get to it. We'll get a button. So. Well, that, that's what's gonna happen, David, if you uh, do a for loop through a string. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be careful you get every step right. It's pretty confusing, or it's tough, but it's tough on purpose so that you really get indexing down and lists and for loops. All right, any other questions? I think that's all the time we have today. Um, the next class is going to be on Monday, and uh, it's our final one where we go over um, kind of the different paths you can do. Like if you take our other courses, um, the different options and, and career paths uh, and specializations you can do with Python. Um, so it's more of like an informational session. Oh, Santa's here. Santa, you're talking to all panelists. Um, how many people are in this class? Let me see. Like 30. And a great introduction to data science. Or data science, if you pronounce it that way. No, there's not going to be um, another Thursday session next week, as far as I know. Um, the introduction to Python course starts the day after, I believe, uh, Monday, so next Tuesday. That'll start. So if you are interested in continuing on with us, you kind of have an idea of our teaching style. Um, the, the classes are generally smaller um, and there's better help. Everything's a little bit more put together um, than this free course is. Um, and it's more one-on-one -on -one, or it's more like personalized. It's, it's a lot better and there's projects and all sorts of wonderful stuff that we're going to plug on Monday in the class. But if you're interested, get in touch with Santiago um, because it's probably good to get the ball rolling on that earlier than later. All right. That's it. I'm not sure what you're asking for a link for, Jason. I'm bamboozled. Oh, that uh, stuff he was saying is going to be in the class on Monday. All right, you guys are the hardcore kids who stuck around for the extra session, so you clearly want to learn. So good luck. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for dedication, you know. The free course information lasts forever. And honestly, we're only going to improve it. We might make some changes, improve the readings and stuff. Um, yeah, if you guys um, want to help contribute to it, uh, you know, there's the whole entire um, GitHub. All of our stuff is based out of there. So it's open source and if you want to help, like if you felt like um, an assignment was too confusing or you have a comment or something, just post on the GitHub. Um, or if you want to make an assignment, if you want to be cool and immortalized, you know, um, yeah. So see you all on Monday and have a great weekend. Does GitHub have what? 
That's an incomplete sentence, Jason. <laughs> yep, you're all welcome. Hope you guys enjoyed. Do your solutions go to GitHub ever? No, not the stuff you guys do. That's um, those are just the solutions that we put up there. All right, let Santa know if you're interested in taking the other stuff. How does the class affect GitHub? The class does not affect GitHub. GitHub affects the class. Everything that is on GitHub is pulled to our platform. And so, like I said, if you wanna, um, no, you don't get a badge in GitHub. <laughs> Um, you can just participate if you want to. It's good practice. Um, <laughs> all right. Catch you guys later. See you next class on Monday. Bye, everyone.